Um, hello everybody and welcome to the next uh, video or episode in our video series. Um, I'm gonna uh, make things more complicated in this uh, this time around. We're gonna create something more complicated. So you know you can see the true power of Deep Effect Studio in action. Okay, um, yeah, let's get started. Um, we're going to create this video here. So as you can see, uh, we've got a cylinder, we've got some water splashing around, we've got foam. So we're going to go through and create every everything here. Uh, the water, we're going to mesh and do stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to generate the foam, we're going to export it. And I'll show you how to do all that in this video. So stay tuned. Uh, this is it's going to be a long video, so it's not going to be like the other videos. So, so yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, um, let's get started. So this is the scene I used, pretty much these are the nodes I used to simulate this. I'm going to go into them properly. But for this we use the DFS SPH solver. Um, the solver is just, uh, it's SPH solver. So DF stands for Dimensions Free. It's uh, SPH is one of the main comp uh, fluid computational, I mean computational fluid dynamics uh, uh, methods out there. Uh, it's very powerful. It was originally created to simulate galaxies, but it made its way to movies, video games, and uh, this sort of thing. So I'm just... Uh, I'll find a video here uh, to show you um, the original paper where this was implemented. But this is not exactly the same as this paper. I was a derivative of this, so it's not a direct implementation. We've taken some liberties to improve stuff here and there. Okay, yeah, this is the paper. So as you can see, you be you can actually do stuff like this. Well, there's nothing stopping you. And we'll probably make a tutorial on doing something similar to show off the power of our solver. Okay, you can simulate these types of particle amounts. This is just showing what makes DFS different. And this is this is pretty new uh, uh, in terms of research, of course. Okay. Okay, so this is how we will begin our lesson. <coughs> Uh -huh. Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, like I said, divergence free, but um, we won't be using divergence free here. Um, we don't need it. Um, uh, mainly, we're going to focus on creating some wild effects, and divergence free it can be used for wild effects, but we don't need it here. We want to uh, to let the solver be a little bit wild, so we're going to also remove the constraints. Uh, and that are put on top of the solver. So the default solver's got a lot of things to help you uh, create calm fluids. So it's not designed to, it's not initially set up to create really wild stuff, okay? Um, okay, one second. Um, Okay, uh, so uh, this is, uh, if you remember the last tutorial, we set up something really basic. So I set up something similar, but I'm using the tube this time just to show you the more calmer settings and uh, the rigid object, particle rigid object, which we will not be using here, but I will show the differences in a moment. Mm -hmm. 
so yeah, yeah, you have to flip the normals uh, or else the particles will go through. And as you can see, it's normal, but the problem with the particle rigid one, when I'm gonna use it is because particles just slip through boundaries. The particles are tiny. So radius has to match. So yeah, it's good for con concave objects, but not really convex. I mean, it's good for convex objects, but not really good for concave objects. Cause you know, the corners, things get ugly because SPH is a simulation technique uh, that takes the particles into account and they push each other using pressures. But it's perfectly fine to use it in other like particle effects that don't take neighbors into account. It's, it works perfectly in those situations. Okay. Okay. Okay, so... Yeah, and that's the main reason we won't be using this... Uh, this collision technique. Okay. Let me just show you something else. Ah, sorry, uh, I had a problem here. My visual software was acting up. One second. Ah, okay. So, we're going to use uh, particles for the boundary, not the uh, mesh or triangles. We're going to ignore that. We're going to use particles because uh, we can use the particles as part of the SPH simulation, making it more physically accurate. Here, I set up a sphere and plugged it into a mesh voxelizer, made sure I switched it onto surface, and then it's going to generate some particles for us on the surface. As you can see, I'll hide the sphere so you can have a better look. So this is going to be our boundary, or what we used for the cylinder. And this is actually more realistic than the uh, part of the, uh, the mesh, but the mesh also provides a smoother simulation. So it depends on what type of look you're trying to achieve. Both are useful, of course. Okay. Then you have to make sure that um, the particle size or the voxel size for this so, uh, is equal to the diameter of the uh, uh, particle size. This is very important actually. And the particle or ra particle radius, uh, which is actually the particle size, so the diameter is just double that. So we're using well, the default solver is 0 0.02. Yeah, so this is very important. So for the for the solver, so the solver dictates di dictates the size of the particles in your simulation. And so for here, and uh, the default is 0 0.02, as I was saying, but I use something else for the final. And the lower you go, the higher the resolution of your fluid sim is. So this is actually how you would upraise your sim after testing it. So that's what I did. Uh, so yeah, it's very important. Oh, and make sure that your time step is always smaller than your particle radius. Otherwise, things just won't work properly. Yeah, so just make sure voxel size is the diameter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the time step. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. So yes, to set up the scene, it was really basic. I created a cylinder, scaled it, translated it in Blender, very straightforward, nothing complicated. Of course, I could have triangulated it better here for the particle rigid object, 
but uh, I left it just as an example. So it was actually triangulated in uh, DeepFX Studio automatically, because DeepFX Studio only takes triangulated meshes. Okay, and then I just used Collada to export it. Okay, so then after that, it's easy to import a Collada file. I'll just demonstrate that quickly. Okay, just go to File, Import, and Import Collada. Like that, and then you're done. And everything fits nicely. So Collada takes care of a lot of the uh, rotation is uh, access issues. For example, left-handed, right-handed, you get uh, and for Blender and for most packages. So I haven't had a problem yet. It works uh, pretty easily. Okay. Um, moving on. Okay. Okay. So we won't be using that. We'll be using the particles. Yeah, so make sure you watch the earlier videos if you haven't. Oh, and please make sure you've got the latest version. So this is zero point version zero point two one. I think I used the different version in the earlier ones before this one was available. So if you see something that's not available in your version, it's probably because you've got an older version of uh, version of DeepFX Studio. So make sure you update. Okay, what's next thing. So this is the final simulation, but as you can see, it's very messy. But I want—I left it like that on purpose because I didn't. I removed a lot of restrictions. I, I was mainly focusing on the look, not really the complete realism. I didn't want it to be completely physically accurate, but that's no problem because DeepFX allows you to clean this up very easily in post-processing. But what I wanted here was the wild fluids, the bouncing off the walls. I wanted the momentum. As you can see, the, uh, the it looks like, uh, like wild water. That's what I wanted. That was what I was going for. Okay, so for that I had to remove the, a lot of the defaults that uh, protect you. But I set up another, vid, uh, another example just to show you that the penetration of the particles is actually intentional. You can actually get a really accurate uh, collisions with the particles if you want. But here I was using, um, the reason this works really well here is that I didn't lower the sub steps. I didn't want, I mean the time steps. I didn't want the simulation to be too long. So uh, this is using the default sub steps, but I've increased the size so it's easier for the particles to be caught. But in that other situation, I could have also lowered the time steps, but that would have increased the simulation time. I wasn't interested in that, so that's why that's happening. Just in case you run into these problems, so you see that's happening. Okay. Uh, yes, so this is the final one we will be talking about. Let's just expand this so we can have a better look. Um, no, 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 this is the wrong one, sorry. This is for the foam. Uh, let me just open the right one. Uh, we'll just use the other one. It's exactly the same, apart from the size, actually. Okay, let me just expand this. <clears throat> okay. So, I've set up my uh, network in a very procedural way. So, as I said, the particle radius is very important. As you can see, I set up a value node and a multiply node that will control the resolution of my simulation. So I, all I have to do is change it in one place and it will affect the whole uh, tree. So here, I, uh, let me just rename it. Uh, sorry about the little bug here, the naming. The names are just off. I'll, that'll be fixed soon. So it's not create box, it's actually to rename. So I'm just gonna rename this to particle radius so we see what's happening. Yes, again, make sure you've got uh, version 0 0.21. <clears throat> okay. 
Okay. Um, then I've got a multiply node. Um, yeah, this is just like I said, the diameter that goes into the voxel, the um, voxelized node. Um, yeah, so it's not exactly two. Um, I use something different because, of course, like I said, time steps and all that. Uh, I had to make the particles tighter. So that's why that's not exactly two. But if they were bigger, that wouldn't be a problem. So, so if you don't want to force yourself to do this, uh, to use this, you can always drop the sub steps. So, but make sure your sub step, I mean, time steps. But also make sure you adjust your time steps here. This is for 30 frames per second. So this is roughly, that's how many seconds it would take for the time steps, okay? So that's 0 0.001, that's how many, that's a second, okay? So 20 of those roughly equal to one second. So 30 frames per second does this, uh, does that. Uh, sorry, to add, if you add it all up, it'll be one second when you do the 30 frames times the sub steps, if you add all that up together, okay? okay. So for the final simulation, I used uh, a radius of 0 0.012, which proved to be okay. Okay, so the, here's 0 0.4, 0 0.04. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Yes, uh, okay. Okay. So um, I'll walk through the settings here. Okay, so one second. All right, right. Um, for the default settings, are actually quite good. There's a reason we've set them up like that. I will demonstrate in a moment. Um, it's good for simulating calm fluids, okay? So, SPH preserves uh, momentum really well, but if you want to simulate stuff like this, the default settings are perfect. The fluids are calm, it's like water foam won't be forming in this, exactly. So it's like pouring into the tumbler type of thing. So the default settings are good for stuff like this, to get really realistic water pouring into a cup. But I wanted to create something more, you know, more wild and violent, so I had to remove uh, these constraints, which I'll talk about in a moment. But yes, if you want to get effects like this, I would stick with the default settings or just uh, tweak them a bit more. Okay, okay. So yeah, so after I removed them, I got something more like this. As you can see, the waves crashing back and forth, the momentum being conserved. Back and forth. So if you want to get that type of energy in your simulation, you might have to, you know, remove some of these. You might have to make things a bit more lively. Which SPH is good at, of course. So yes, and that is the main reason that I did that. Okay, moving on. Uh, let me just bring up the default settings so we can compare these two things. Uh, 
Yeah, so time step, I left it, I didn't change it because I wanted to keep that, you know, the speed. But remember to match your sub steps, otherwise you won't get this type of, this is at 30 frames per second, like I said. So make sure you adjust your sub steps to match your time steps. So for 0 0.001, 20 sub steps is roughly that. I didn't switch on divergence free, but density error is very important. I think I changed this, I made it into one. So descent error is just how accurate you want your fluids to be. So SPH is, like I said, is used in real world for engineering problems. So the density error, the lower it is, the more accurate you get, okay? But since we're simulating something for visual, since accuracy, absolute accuracy is not, you know, the data behind it, there's no difference, the difference is not vi visually there. I upped it to 1%. So those values are actually in percentages. Uh, so 1 to 10 is good, is okay, will probably work in most cases, okay. Um, yeah, so 1 to 10 percent, oh, 0 0.01 is okay, to provide a very stiff simulation, so you, uh, you'll probably leave it there if, when you're getting started, but you can play with it. Uh, to make more sense, I guess, the more you get used to the solver, but yes, just the density because, you know, liquids are incomprehensible and, you know, you can't squash them. You know, like an hydraulic pin, if you push it, it'll push back type of thing. The next thing will be the divergence error. We're not using it, so I won't talk to that. It's also a percentage, like the density error. Like that. Okay. Uh, yes, just a percentage. So we're not going to use that. And then I had to put up the pressure relaxation. So density and pressure are connected, okay? So I, I, it's dampened here because uh, uh, the density re, uh, error was really, really small. So, you know, to avoid that rigid look, I relaxed it as well. And to, uh, to avoid popping effects and oscillations, I dropped the pressure. But since I, you know, I dropped the uh, error, I upped the relaxation nearly to one, that's okay. And that's good that to preserve the momentum even better. So that's okay. Uh, yeah, so you can, pressure relaxation is just, you know, the pressure in water, which is related to, you need pressure for the density to be preserved type of thing. Uh, we won't be touching coupling stiffness. That's about the rigid solver. You can plug in the bullet solver into this, which is pretty cool, to create a multi-physics solver. So if I, I can just show this quickly, but it will be for another tutorial, probably maybe the next one, we'll look into this. Uh, the bullet's actually got a compute mode, you can make it into a slave, and then plug it into the different solver, and the solver will take over from there. And yeah, and we can uh, do some pretty cool stuff with that, like some nice water effects. Uh, sorry, small crash. Recording software. One second. One second. One second. Okay. Okay. Mm, I'll just reload. Simulation. One second. Okay, yeah, this is the one. Continue, I'm just continue explaining the uh, settings. Yes, okay, okay. So I talked about coupling stiffness. That velocity dampening is very important. I, dr I s actually switched it off here, so it's on by default. This is actually what helps calm the fluids down and brings them to a stop. It actually smooths out the velocity, so gradually decreasing the momentum, which is important, like example, or like the tumbler where the water is not supposed to, you know, uh, 
mm, rotate into infinity. Okay, so by default, it's actually quite high at 0 0.002. High values of uh, velocity will create weird stuff. So, I mean, velocity dampening. So, keeping it at a low value is pretty good. Even lower than that is actually good. You still get similar. It smooths it really well. Okay, so it's zero for the final setup. Okay. Uh, I'll just delete that. Uh -huh. So we've talked about the voxelizer node already from the value to multiply. Okay, that makes sense. So you should understand the workflow there. So like I said, 1.2 for the final. Mm, and these are the forces. We'll talk about that soon. Okay, now let's look at the emitter. We'll talk about the shape emitter. If you saw the earlier simulation video, we introduced you to the emitter. I didn't explain going through the details, but I can do that now. So it's got two modes, got a, a circle shape and a box shape. For the final here, we use 300,000 particles. So you can go higher, of course, there's no limit to this. So for 300,000 particles, minus the white, uh, the foam particles. So the foam particles are a separate simulation. And the liquid alone comes down to 300,000 in total. Of course, my, yeah, 300,000 particles in total emitted from the uh, emitter. Okay. And uh, yeah, okay. And uh, yes, don't forget the particle radius to be linked. So to the value that's important, obviously that uh, determines the how the particles are emitted. You might start emitting particles and it will look like the volume is being lost if your particle radius for the solver is smaller than the emitter. Okay, very important to plug that in. Uh -huh. And uh, strength is the normal 10. I didn't change that. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so I was going to drop it, but you know, I was getting a really good effect. If you drop it, you would actually have less penetrations from the particles, you know. Because also uh, the speed is also linked to the time step, you know, the smaller the steps, that type of sort of thing. Circle radius is simply a 3. And of course, we don't use the rectangle width since we're using the circle shape for that. Ah, sorry, keep clicking on the wrong page. Okay. Next. Um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I think I uh, talked about the voxelizer, so it's got two modes, the surface, and the volume. So you could always use the volume, uh, but I know, I mean, not in this case, since you want the inside to be hollow. So we just use the surface, but uh, you need to make sure your particles. Sometimes the particles you might have holes, so you need to, you can just drop in a particle, a point of view, sorry, uh, which, which just which just helps you see the particles or the points that you're generating. So if I plug that in, yes, you see this minus a uh, transform, of course, which which we haven't accounted for. Um, but if you want to apply the transform to view it, there's a point x form, but the SPH point rigid does it automatically for us, yeah. But just for others, you could just uh, add a x form to give you the same results for that. Okay. Then, yes, we plug in the SPH rigid into the point rigid. It's not the same as the particle rigid, but uh, th this one is under SPH. Uh, yeah, it's under the SPH uh, menu, so that uh, don't confuse those two. This one uses points for the boundaries. 
and yeah so you can actually keyframe your cylinder and yeah I do really to calculate that to translate the particles automatically as you do that then we talked about the group node the uh, DFS solver will search for anything SPH related of course you can plug all these in directly but you since you want multiple things in your uh, solver, you use the group node to group them. Very straightforward. Okay. And of course, we've got a time info node that's used to trigger the solver at each step. Okay, and then we've plugged that obviously into the cache. We've got two caches here, one for viewport rendering and one to saving to disk. So that's why we've got the indexes into there, just to show which index we're at when we catch those particles. And for the particle caches, we just save out BGO. For now, we'll have more in the future. Of course, you can use those BGOs in Houdini or whichever other project, whichever other, whichever other program supports that file format. <coughs> Okay, it's pretty, the cache again is similar to Olympic, you just specify a directory, a cache name, and it will save the disk as a sequence of files. Okay. And that's just the memory cache at the top, so automatically just renders that for us in the viewport. We can talk about the forces. So it is advised to always have viscosity in your scene. It's optional, but if you want uh, to avoid numerical instabilities that are introduced by these sort of techniques, viscosity adding into viscosity is never a bad idea, and to actually give more realistic results as well. So here we've left at the default of 0 0.05, but you could also have a boundary viscosity. But I left it out because obviously I wanted the I wanted a smooth flow. For my simulation i didn't want the particles you know the boundary slowing it down uh, and this is not high viscosity slow viscosity so if you want to uh, like buckling jet buckling that won't work so yeah so this is for it really doesn't affect it as you see it. it's really f uh, fluid motion at this value but the higher you will start getting uh, fluids will start becoming like honey okay but not completely viscous you know like not like a hard viscosity. So we don't calculate strain for this. It's a one-sided viscosity. Okay. Then we've added vorticity to the simulation as well. Vorticity since just helps create those nice swirly effects, as you can see. By adding vortices into the simulation, so the rotation of what our vortices are that rotational. You can even see the the foam under the water spinning. That's vorticity in there. So that's what that's for. We've left that at the. Uh, I think I increased that slightly. I think it's point zero nine. Yeah. So to get that, that actually uh, helps. Uh, you know, help some of the particles escape so it adds more energy spinning energy to the simulation yes i hope that makes sense yes uh, that's about it so yeah so that explains the whole Network, hope that makes sense. Uh, I've gone through everything. If you've got questions, anything, please make a comment below. I'd like to hear feedback from people, what they think about this workflow. Of course, I know everybody won't be a fan of it, but I think it's powerful, stuff like that. And yeah, okay. Of course, there's more forces that will add more. There's adhesion here. And in the future, we'll add another vorticity, a more interesting one that's just been released 
Well, more research has been released on that. We'll, we'll implement that. I'll give that to you. Okay. Next, we're going to look at generating the foam. This is the final simulation, like I said. We're just uh, including it here. So this is what we have after I've simulated it using a particle radius of 0 0.012. Of course, I started at a higher resolution. Once I was happy, I just changed the number and I cached that to disk. So we're going to clean up those particles later. It's not going to be a big deal. So, oh, in order to do that, make sure you've got the latest version, like I said, make sure you've got 0 0.21 and above. If you've got an older version, please just download, just update your uh, copy. So, yeah, this I uh, simulated for 450 frames. Yeah, so we get really nice wild particles over here. You can see the velocities there looking really nice. Uh -huh. yeah, so, so this really helps us all create nice looking foam, generates nice foam. Uh, and we'll go into that soon. Right, so I was talking about cleaning up the particles. We've uh, added the kill volumes to this. So all kill volumes do is uh, create a bounding box from the input geometry. Okay. And then all particles uh, that are inside or outside will be eliminated. So you can specify inside, outside, which particles you don't want. So here we don't want any particles outside the simulation to live on. Okay, so if you want, you can actually do the opposite and set up some kill volumes outside and stop particles. So that's good for other types of scenarios. So let me just show you what happens after the particles are being cleaned up. So I'm just going to switch off the input cache so that's the way using cache from the disk here so I've just imported that cache so I'm going to use a point view to show uh, the output Um, as you, oh, sorry, no, no, that's the wrong, no, after the kill volume, and good, there you see, so now you can see that all the uh, rogue particles are gone, the volume is cleaned up nicely, we've filtered out all the bad stuff, and we've kept the stuff we want, okay, and the workflow is uh, straightforward. We'll probably add some more filters and uh, some more ways to filter the particles in the future. Maybe according to particle neighbor count, stuff like that. Okay, so we can now look at this 
Uh, no, it looks big. It's a monstrosity, but all the values here actually make sense. Actually, you don't have to pay attention to half of these for this video. Um, here, there's only a few values you need to pay attention to to create to this scene. But in the future, if you want to have more control, you will we will dig deeper into them. The reason there's so many values is because this is physically correct um, type of foam, and we're not really just generating foam here. We're generating bubbles, foam. And spray, but for this iteration, we're just uh, piping everything out into into one big chunk. But in the future, we're going to separate out the positions. We're going to split them into bubbles, foam, and spray. Then, when you're rendering out, you, you can assign uh, unique materials to each one, so it looks you have more fidelity in your simulation. Okay. But for now, just uh, keep in mind it's, uh, it's it's grouping these together. That's why you've got so many. It's generating three types of particles. That's why you've got so many inputs here. And each one is physically correct. So, as you can see here, so yeah. Yeah, so when the particles are in the water, there'll be bubbles, in the air, there'll be spray, and when they're in the water, there'll be foam. So, um, we don't really need high sub steps here because uh, I mean time steps. We can use small time steps because, or I mean bigger time steps. Sorry, uh, because um, uh, the simulation was already you know it was done at a higher rate, and we don't really and the foam solver can operate at uh, thirty frames per second. Since I use thirty frames, this is actually one divide thirty, so you get one point zero point one six six, which is just thirty frames per second. Okay. Okay, um, yes. And then the mass is just the mass. This is just like Newtonian physics. Mass is equal to, is related to acceleration, stuff like that. And then max life is just how long do you want the particles? This is in seconds. So here it's 20 seconds. This is really high. They're never going to die here, but this is just good for experimenting. Uh, yeah, so I use something different for the final. I think it was 3 to 5 seconds. Okay. Since I think the total for 450 frames or 30 frames in a second is roughly, yeah, it is. It's 15 seconds. At that time step, of course. So one time step, I mean, one sub step here. So it's pretty fast um, to simulate this. I guess depending on how many particles you have. The most, uh, the only uh, taxing part of this is actually the neighbor search and uh, the calculating the potentials, which uses SPH, like I said. So the air potential, max air wave potential, are all SPH components. Okay, but they're not that important. The most important one, they are important, but the one that affects all of them is the energy potential, which the energy is actually the kinetic energy. So if the kinetic energy is zero, which uh, the uh, the minimum and maximum determines, of course, what is cut off, I, the other potentials will be ignored, okay? So they're all part of one big equation, even though they're separate uh, bits and pieces of the simulation. So you need to make sure that uh, your energy is within bounds. Otherwise, you won't see any particles being generated. And I'll demonstrate that soon. So if I just hit uh, forward once, it generate the foam solver for every frame will generate this for you information. It will tell you, so you don't have to guess. You will get the values here. Yeah, so um, as you can see, it gives you the air potential. So you probably have to simulate this once to actually understand. Every simulation is different. So you, once you've simulated, you have your parameters, your mins and maxes, so you can fine tune it after that. So this is faster than actually simulating in SP8, so it shouldn't be a, a big problem to do that. So the first thing you should look at, main one, is just the max energy. Me, make sure that your energies are within the bound. So you don't want foam just to be generated when you emit stuff, but in certain situation where it splashes a certain way. So this allows you to tune that. So you, at each frame, it will tell you, for example, the main energy, max energy. 
okay and then the clamped energy is just the uh, the it's a multiple that's multiplied by the potential so zero means zero zero percent a value of one which is the highest clamp value just means a hundred percent okay and so take hundred percent of the energy into account uh, so yeah so make sure your particle size matches your SPH otherwise uh, which I actually forgot this as well when doing this you'll be getting very high values if your SPH simulation was particle size was smaller and you're using a bigger particle size okay so if you start seeing kinetic energy equal to the velocity that you use for your simulation then well it doesn't really mean there's an error but it's most likely that um, your particle size is wrong okay so uh, make sure those match okay so there's actually an analyze mode so which is really fast to get the kinetic energy or it does just calculate the kinetic energy so with that in hand once you've done that you pretty much have a good idea of um, which kinetic energies to use I ended up using something much smaller than these ones you see here I, I just didn't save the file um, one second Let's see if I can find if I did save it. I don't think I did, but I can never be too sure. Let's see. Um, no, 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 I did not. I don't think I did. Yes, yeah, so um, these are the wrong actually energy potentials. These are for 0 0.02 particle size, okay? So the particle size obviously will affect uh, bigger particles being heavier particles, and obviously that will affect, you know, your laws of, uh, you know, momentum and all that stuff. So I'll make sure they match to get the correct, uh, since everything is physically correct. So these quantities do matter. They do produce real world, you know, quantities like mass, weight, internally. So I can just show you the foam once everything has been cached out. So this is the foam sim. So I'm just importing a cache of my final foam simulation. Okay, so I'll plug that in. Then, yeah. So this is my foam at frame around 18. So it's generating the foam. And off we go. So I think this is the immortal version where the particles don't die. I actually did another one after this. So after I understood how many particles I had, and, uh, you know, I know exactly roughly when I want them to die. So I, I've got that in mind. Of course, I can... Then re-simulate this again. So this didn't take well, it didn't take that long, I think. Uh, I think it was like what thirty minutes for each iteration, thirty twenty minutes each iteration, because you know depending on how many particles are being generated, you can adjust that as well. And I'm using a laptop here, so it's pretty much f it's faster on a workstation. So that uh, for three hundred thousand particles anyway, so. The higher you go, obviously, you have uh, a higher strain on your computer. Okay, so, and then there's buoyancy and drag, which is important, of course. These are just, uh, you know, standard physics. Buoyancy is just for things that float eventually from the bottom to the top. Drag is just, uh, will control how... Uh, how your particles follow the current of the liquid. So, the higher the drag, uh, the less that your particles will, f uh, will, f will follow the the flow of the simulations, okay? And the buoyancy is just how fast your particles rise to the surface, if, or if they rise at all, okay? So those you can see here in action. So the particles are following uh, the fluid uh, quite well, actually. And rising to the top, as you can see, and then... Uh, Okay. Great. 
Yeah, so um, yeah, that's that's how you get this effect. Okay, that's pretty much it. Then you catch these out to your file. Um, I think we're gonna call it uh, quits just now. I think that's about it for this. Have I forgotten anything? The next, um, I'll simulate this just to show you that it actually works. Okay, I'll show you. But then we're gonna save uh, the meshing for another video. Oh, it's not gonna be as long as this, but we'll save it as a separate video since. A, it can be you know it's an it's not uh, it's a separate thing that can be applied to different things but I'll show you how I mesh this using open VDB tools okay so let's see if I can just simulate the foam here so I'm just to show you that's not bad so I'm just taking the energy into account okay just doing the values so make sure, so the potentials, uh, I've already explained them to you, so just make sure you input the correct um, minimums and maximums according to your simulations to be different for each simulation. Okay, so I'm going, this is the actual simulation, then once again I'm just going to hide it. And then it should be producing particles at some Point. Wait a minute. No, no, something is wrong. Once again, once again, once again. Wait, something is off. Um, now it's catching to memory. Oh, yes, I think. What did I change? Once again, this should be showing. Uh, energy is a bit high. So, um, just reset that. Right, no, no, particle size. Like I said, I forgot I had made the mistake. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to use, I'm getting values for the bigger particle size. So I'm just going to drop this. I've forgotten the, the final ones I use. So I'm just going to put it at 0 0.2. So, particles are heavier. So, that's why I'm getting these values here. So, I'm just going to. This should start producing uh, our foam around 15 frames, 17 there. Again, there we go. Yes, it's just the, I was using the wrong energy there. So they were too small, but once I put them at 0 0.02, we start getting our uh, foam particles, as you could see. Okay. Yeah, that's about it. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, in the next video will cover uh, the meshing. And we used meshing for the liquids, as you can see, and the particles. I'm going to find a way to export the particles to Blender. If somebody knows, I don't know, I'm new to Blender, getting used to it. Uh, of course, I'd like to hear comments. Make a comment. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Follow us, support us. We want to make some cool stuff here. Uh, um yeah so uh, see you in the next video um uh thanks for watching